Hey, welcome to the Chakra Movie. This special project first began over 10 years ago with the launch of our original Spirit Science episodes. Before we begin, I wanna give a shout out to you, this amazing community that made these videos possible. Spirit Science was made for you, and it's because of you that it exists today. It's for this reason we've created a place for the Spirit Science community to gather. For only $1 a month, you can become a supporter of Spirit Science and access all of our videos completely ad-free along with a custom mobile app, private messaging, polls, and invitation to live events. It's thanks to you and your support that we can continue to create more episodes for you on a weekly basis. We never want Spirit Science to go away. And if you feel the same, visit spiritmysteries.school and enjoy ad-free Spirit Science today. Today more than ever, the world seems to be in a very disharmonic state. Thanks to modern internet technology, we now have access to all the world's information at our fingertips. And yet, the algorithms behind the mainstream tech we all use only shows us what we're accustomed to seeing, creating social divides the likes of which we've never seen before. If we took an outside perspective on our species though, you might say that we've always been disharmonic. And that's kind of true. In fact, if our esoteric history is to be believed, we've been growing more and more disharmonic for about 13,000 years now. It's in our DNA and it's something that we're passing through as a species together. There is good news though. We're nearing the end of this paradigm, this karmic cycle of disconnection and suffering. And ideally, we will never be here again. At the moment, we're just not in tune with ourselves and our collective consciousness is beginning to realize it. The reason for our disconnection from the soul is actually fairly simple. And no, it's not about politics, greed, capitalism, or any of that stuff. In fact, all of those are simply long-term manifestations of the real problem, which lies on a deeper, much more personal level. The true problem actually lies in our old way of thinking, creating tension on every level. Right now, as you're watching this video, all of us are going through something of a shift. We are changing into a completely new state of being with a new way of thinking and a different understanding of our multiphasic holographic reality. Today, we're going to break down the concept of chakras like you've never seen it before, a deluxe special remake that unifies all of our original episodes into something even greater. If you've been around this channel long enough or have seen like any meditation or spiritual based movie of the last 10 years, you'll probably know that one of the most central and core themes of many new age disciplines is the seven chakra system. Whether you've used them as meditation aids or seen them in gift shops, you're probably at least somewhat familiar with the idea. If not, keep watching or, you know, just watch Dr. Strange and see how it turned out for him. When getting started with the new age concept of chakras, first we have to understand the basics of light and color. If you take white light and shine it through a prism, the light will break into a spectrum of seven colors. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Aw oh, yeah, Roy G. Biv. You can do this at home with your own prism, or maybe you tried it in science class at school. We familiarly recognize this as the spectrum of the rainbow, or even more familiar, the basic palette in Photoshop. Scientifically though, this whole prism effect and all of the colors it produces are generally called Newtonian colors, and for the most part are the foundation of the visible color spectrum. Now, of course, there are way more than just seven colors, especially when you get into different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum and perhaps even different dimensions. But let's just, you know, let's stick with these for now. The thing about color is that each one actually has its own vibration. Red has the longest wavelength and the slowest vibrational frequency. And today we generally recognize it as warm and stimulating. Violet has the shortest wavelength and the fastest frequency, and we recognize it as cool and calming. I don't think I have to describe what happens between these two colors. It's like a frequency change that gets shorter and faster as you move up the spectrum. This basic knowledge, believe it or not, is very important, but we're gonna have to look at some other things first. So what is a chakra? Well, it's usually believed that the word chakra comes from the Sanskrit word meaning wheel, which is partly true, but not the whole story. And we'll get to that later on. In our modern understanding though, a chakra is a wheel-like vortex spinning in a circular motion within the body. 
It forms a vacuum in the center that draws in energy on a vibrational level and can draw in anything from color vibration to thoughts and feelings of other people that we come into contact with. So in essence, chakras are energy points or centers that run vertically from the top of your head down your spine, or, you know, from the bottom all the way up. Think of them like pools of energy in our body. When left to their natural state, they will flow seamlessly, but life is messy and stuff like emotions, abuse, and bad experiences get in the way. And much like moss or algae, it blocks the creek from flowing. Ah, you caught me. I'm quoting Airbender on that last bit. Now, despite how you look at it, there are seven, eight, or 13 primary chakras, as well as over hundreds of smaller, minor ones that are scattered throughout the body along certain channels known as axiotonal lines. We'll cover the eight and 13 later on though. So for right now, let's stick with the basic seven. As we understand it, your chakras are kind of like the etheric motor of the soul. Not only do your chakras draw in energy, each and every chakra radiates an energy or vibration and governs over a major organ or gland connected to other body parts that resonate at the same frequency. To have balanced and aligned chakras will make you happier, healthier, and more in tune with yourself. When one chakra center is out of sync, it may eventually affect the organs and glands that it's connected to and cause the chakras neighboring it to also go out of sync, causing a chain reaction and many bodily imbalances. A chakra can become out of balance when it is overactive, underactive, or possibly congested or blocked. This is almost always felt on a mental, emotional, or physical level. The benefits to energizing your chakras and learning about them are primarily for our harmony of mind, body, and spirit. Your mind alone cannot nurture your whole being, nor can a proper food diet solve all of your problems. It is through your chakras that you can learn to balance all aspects of yourself, bringing you into a healthier state of consciousness. As we mentioned earlier, each chakra is connected to an organ or gland, which governs over a section of the body. The order of the chakras is generally thought to go from the bottom up, starting with red and changing vibrations in each chakra until you get to violet. However, we've recently discovered that you can explore them the other way, starting with a higher awareness and bringing it down into your body. This is exactly the methodology behind the seven day transformation, a one of a kind course that has seen thousands of people change their lives and share their stories about it. And you can learn more about that by clicking the link in the description. It truly is profound. Now, when you break light apart, you get seven colors. These are the same seven colors that our physical body is tethered to. What would you see if you were to look at a human being through an etheric energy prism? Are we bodies of light? Think about it. Now, not only does each chakra connect to an organ or gland, but each chakra also has a very specific trait. The first chakra is survival and is connected to the adrenal gland. The next one, the sacral, is governed sex or interaction and is connected to the reproductive organs. The third is the solar plexus, power or ego, and connected to the pancreas and is often cited as being similar to the Sea of Chi mentioned in Taoist alchemical texts like the secret of the golden flower. The fourth is based in love and connects to the thymus and the heart. The fifth, the throat, is expression and connects to the thyroid. The sixth is called the third eye, which is psychic and intuitive and connects to the pituitary gland. And finally, we have the crown chakra, which is the spiritual chakra and connects to the pineal gland. Although this is debated, and some say that the pineal gland is also connected to the third eye and the pituitary gland with the crown. Now, survival, sex, power, love, expression, vision, and spirituality. These are the seven traits through which we grow and are at the core of our being and relate to our existence on a fundamental level. Understanding this system and being present with it can help us find out where we're in or out of balance. Okay, so, after all that, we know a fair bit about what chakras are now, yet we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of this topic. Let's talk about opening, activating, and charging your chakras. Do you know of a time when you were struggling with your ego or didn't seem to have a heart or couldn't express yourself in your usual way? If you or anyone you know has a problem or comes off too strong in any of these traits, the reason why could be because of an imbalance within the chakras. As we know, each chakra resonates to a color, Doing something as simple as wearing clothing that matches the color of a chakra can even cause it to resonate. I remember when I was first learning about this, all of my chakras were closed except for my throat, which was way too open. The reason for this was because my bedroom was painted blue as well as my bed sheets. And every night I would get a chakra boost in that one area. 
And the reason that something like the color of your room would have an effect on chakras is specifically because everything has a vibration and our environments stimulate us to think, feel, and take action just as much as our own thoughts do. If you don't believe us, just check out our episode on the biology of belief. And if that's not good enough, just ask Google why they spent millions upon millions of dollars testing what colors would compel people to use their products and services more and spend more money at the same time. Now, sunlight is of course our main source and provider of light, heat, and energy. Sunlight itself consists of energies in the form of cosmic rays, gamma rays, X-rays, visible light rays, infrared rays, microwaves, and even radio waves. I mean, let's be real. The sun is just basically constantly waving at us. Ha ha, boom tsh. So straight up, lying in the sun for half an hour can give you a powerful energy boost in addition to all of that delicious vitamin D. Mm -mm. Our skin loves that stuff. In fact, the practice of sun gazing during sunset or sunrise when it's actually safe to do is an ancient practice that was said to bring numerous benefits and skyrocket your ascension process that is attested to by many ancient yogis. Generally speaking, even something as simple as eating food that matches the chakra colors is just as good as well. Seriously, it's believed that eating red tomatoes and apples are good for the root chakra. Eating greens are good for the heart. Could blueberries and eggplants open your mind? At least blueberries. You open up an eggplant and it's like, psych solar plexus, fool. Does this make you wanna eat healthier? However, you have to consider what's in the food too. Skittles may seem like it's good for your entire chakra body of consciousness, but they probably break every chakra considering what's in them. But on that note, if you wanna learn more, check out our movie called Healing with Food. Finally, the best way to open your chakras, hands down, is meditation. There are tons of meditations and chakra cleansings out on the web. In fact, we've made one too, and we'll share it with you soon. Sometimes though, it's as easy as just visualizing the chakra in the area that it's in and seeing it open or flood with energy. Buddhist tradition often talks about seeing the chakras as flowers with closed petals and meditating to see them opening and blooming into their full beauty. And finally, another way that you can work with your chakras is through Reiki. See, Reiki masters are people who are sensitive to and trained to work with energy. They learn to move energy throughout their body and connect it and flow it into yours. It's a very amazing process. You may have to ask, but Reiki masters can also typically communicate with your higher self for you and ask you what you need to progress on your path. Reiki itself is growing more and more popular in the last 15 years, so it shouldn't be very hard to find a number of places near you that offer it as a service. If you're serious about this and you don't know where to start, Reiki and meditation are excellent first steps. However, as with everything, be mindful that we don't want to become reliant on external support just to get by. Reiki can be very helpful, just like a plant medicine ceremony, but not so that you can just go and trash your body the next day saying, oh, no worries, I'm just gonna get Reiki again to realign. If you are getting Reiki, do your best to stay aligned after the session ideally supplementing your own health with proper food, meditation, and even exercise. Medical science has proven that toxins and impurities, including negative thoughts, chemicals in our food, and other pollutants can influence the body. If these are consistent, then chakra imbalances can manifest, which may eventually affect us on mental and physical levels. Traditional healthcare at this time is unable to naturally or totally alleviate symptoms, especially before they happen. And this means it's up to us to improve our health conditions on our own. We can't forget that we need to take care of our whole being, not just the parts that gain symptoms. And with that, I bid you adieu. But don't worry, because we'll be back again soon for even more chakra remakes in the spirit science journey. If you haven't guessed by now, understanding the chakras is akin to understanding the cosmic universal flow. It's a scaling and harmonizing of vibration between polarized frequencies. Just looking at the waveform alone, the vibration of red and the vibration of blue are undoubtedly completely different and our chakras are the exact same way. The body is a vehicle, consciousness the driver, yoga is the path and the chakras are the map. So continuing on our journey into the chakras, if you haven't guessed by now, understanding the chakras is akin to understanding the cosmic universal flow. It's a scaling and harmonizing of vibration between polarized frequencies. Just looking at the waveform alone, the vibration of red and the vibration of blue are undoubtedly completely different and our chakras are the exact same way. Now, when a person is living within the realm of one particular chakratic energy, their whole world can be colored by the energy of that frequency. It's kind of like a lens through which everything in existence is interpreted for us. In order to explain this clearly, here's an example. 
You remember the qualities of each chakra that we talked about earlier? Again, briefly, the overview is survival, sex, willpower, love, expression, mindfulness, and finally, higher understanding. So when a soul, sometimes also known as a little fractal of that, which we sometimes call spirit, cosmic consciousness, or God, comes into a new reality in the cycle of incarnation, which is a long way of saying, when a baby is born, they have one thing on their mind and one thing only, survival. They want to be able to survive and stay here to support their physical existence as long as they can. Their whole focus is on being able to survive. They're almost entirely dependent on their guardians during their formative years. And generally speaking, it's the mother and the father who take up that role. Depending on how well mommy and daddy make the infant feel safe and nurtured, the quicker the child can transcend and move on to the next level. Nursing is also a natural way to bring the child into a state of safety, as well as explore the next chakra simultaneously. See, the root chakra is synonymous with support from the environment around you. And if a child is growing up in an unsafe space or there's a lack of nurturing to keep the child feeling safe and explorative, it will take longer for a solid transition to take place and can even cause long-term damage to the understanding of the child. And they could grow up with many traumas, anxiety, and pain. All of these can be dealt with and explored later in life too, but it's definitely a much smoother process if we receive loving support right from the beginning. But it doesn't always happen that way. But don't worry, if that was your childhood, it means there's an abundant opportunity for healing at your door. Now, the moment survival has been achieved, it becomes clear to spirit that there are one or two more chakras available. There are actually two, but spirit may sometimes only see one at first. The next step is that spirit will usually want to make contact with other beings in this reality. After all, we are naturally social creatures. This is almost instinctual. When you're a baby, that's usually interpreted as making contact with your mother and father. It is one of the youngest and earliest actions compelled by the sacral chakra, and it is sexual in nature. Just look at Freud's Oedipus complex, which is not as weird as it sounds, at least when you understand the deeper meaning behind it. As you get older and your sacral chakra matures within you, the same as your other chakras, the desire for contact shifts from the innocence of support from your parents to a different form that I'm sure we're all aware of. Physically, we call it puberty. And you might remember all those uncomfortable talks you got in biology class, but we'd rather not. The essence of the sacral is to reach out, locate, and make contact with the life that exists in the world around you. At a young age, it covers everything from holding your mother to snuggling a kitty. Although this energy has in a way been programmed out of us by our own media and peer groups at this point. Very few people have cuddle puddles nowadays, but I guess snuggling kitties is still socially acceptable. So the next stage is where things get interesting. Generally, for a soul who only has access to these lower chakras, their consciousness is rather self-centered, which is natural. It's why children sometimes have a hard time perceiving the wants and needs of the larger social body around them, because they are still focused on and learning within their own personal growth wants and needs. Unless of course they're an Aquarius, in which case there might be a possibility of them getting mad at everyone for seeing what everyone needs and struggling to communicate it. But I digress. Now that spirit has survived and made contact with other life in the world, the third chakra that's available is called the solar plexus and deals with willpower. In a nutshell, spirit wants to know how and why things work. What are the laws of this new world? How does gravity work? How do you do things? Using your willpower, you try to control the physical world, picking up toys and playing with them, moving things around and, you know, just generally doing stuff, often to the dismay of our parents. We're all familiar with the age called the terrible twos. It's a common age when spirit is very interested and curious and full of willpower and wants to know everything about the world around it, to test it and to see what it can do and what it can't do. A child from here will usually continue until it's satisfied in its basic understanding of reality. And sometimes a child will grow up for many years learning purely in these states with little awareness of anything higher. You see, for most young people growing up, they are unaware that there's a change in the directions after the third chakra. It comes in the form of something we call a half step, also sometimes called a mirror wall, which hides the next four chakras from view. A child usually isn't aware of the many chakra lessons to come or how much more to life there really is. On earth, even when we become adults, we may still not know that there are higher centers in the body. You're probably familiar with the hoity-toity businessman archetype, 
purely focused on their own status and wealth and don't care about whoever they have to step on to level up their personal game. Well, anyone resonating with that mindset is definitely locked into their solar and root chakras, but they can't see the heart because the sacral, the feeling and connecting with others empathically is really not that active. And this is how we ultimately move into the higher centers is by mastering the bottom three in order to perceive and move into something greater. A major exception to this though, is found within the phenomena of the so-called new age children. You know, the indigo, crystal and rainbow kids as they're often described or whatever you might call them in the system of your choosing. In short, these are children who are believed to possess special, unusual, and sometimes supernatural traits or abilities, at least according to any psychological study of them. Oftentimes, these kids are described as old souls who have incarnated into this lifetime to help us break through the old rigid systems and pave the way to a new world. And sometimes they're seen as souls from a much higher dimension who are new to this earth, helping to ground in a higher frequency. The first mention of indigo children comes from concepts developed in the 1960s and 70s by parapsychologist Nancy Ann Tapp, where she talked about life colors, which she believed were the single color of the aura that remains constant in most people from the cradle to the grave. As the world moved into the psychedelic revolution of the 60s and early 70s, Nancy noticed that reports of children with indigo auras being born were growing up and getting much more common as we were evolving as a species. These so-called indigo children generally have a vast wealth of spiritual experience under their belt, seemingly out of nowhere, being able to meditate, understanding the chakras and do energy work at a very early age. This is mostly because they remember their past lives much more easily than other people. So they seem much more mature than other kids of their age. Eh, I mean, it makes sense, especially if they remember having done this whole life thing hundreds of times, they know what they're doing. Now, some people in recent years though, have argued that indigo and the like are the real cause behind conditions like ADHD or just ADD. But this ultimately all comes down to what you believe as naturally the view in medicine is that ADHD is a defect. I also wonder how low vibing foods that many kids are eating affects them on a cellular level. But hey, we have a healing with food movie if you wanna go deeper onto that topic. Regardless, on the subject of ADD, while today it's classified as a disorder, if you're a parent, the idea of having a gifted child is much more appealing than the idea of a broken one. And it may inspire creative action to support them rather than just feeling terrible that your problem child sucks, you know? Because let's be real, they don't suck, they're awesome. They just need some unique support in being able to see it and tap into the magic within them. We're actually working on a course for conscious parenting inside of Spirit Mysteries, and we'll keep you posted on how that's coming along soon. Anyways, some of the other traits common to these new children though, are stuff like high levels of empathy and emotional intelligence at young ages, often seeming much older than they are or having an older energy about them, often being perceived by friends and family as being strange or even alien, possessing a clear sense of self-definition and purpose, showing a strong innate subconscious spirituality from early childhood and even usually having a resistance to rigid control-based paradigms of authority. We sometimes even see natural or innate spiritual wisdom and gifts coming through these children in immaculate splendor. However, it's important not to put too much thought into labels or how we define these spiritual gifts as there is definitely not any kind of true hierarchy to this stuff. Just because some of us come into spirituality at a much older age, doesn't mean that we're any less spiritual than some of the new generation. Especially if your auric field describes whether you're an indigo, rainbow or crystal child, then putting in the effort to, now that we've looked at the lower centers, what happens when we do change and move into the higher ones? Well, to understand that, we need to understand the nature of our body of consciousness. Take the egg of life, the original eight cells of the human body, a form that takes place shortly after conception and is created by a wave spreading across the embryo. This particular biological cell division is important because the body coming into form is perfectly and evenly divided into the four elements with the yin and yang of each giving you eight perfect spheres. These spheres each contain a piece of the whole, each representing a core aspect of the various parts of the human spirit as represented by different body parts. These eight spheres become the first physical representation of the complete eight chakra system, which from root to crown connects the physical energy of the earth through the body to the higher awareness of the dimensions beyond our bodies and our infinite connection with everything else in existence. 
The eighth chakra is the root of the next world, connecting you with your eternal self beyond the limits of your physical form. And as with the heart, a half step hides this portal for those who have reached the higher centers. And before we jump into this, just a reminder, if you're someone who really wants to experience a profound chakra healing, make sure to check out the seven day transformation in which we use the chakra system to completely rewire your consciousness quickly and effortlessly. The best part is it only takes a week. Think of the chakras like your field of awareness and depending on which one you're focused in, your awareness becomes focused and narrow or wide and expansive, kind of like using them as a lens, as we've mentioned earlier. When you're in the root, a survival focus, your perception is narrowed into just one thing, surviving the current crisis or situation that you find yourself in. All in all, it's a very thin beam. But now if you're in the third eye with your other chakras open and satisfied, your expanding vision goes very far and wide in order to see all of the connections at once. Your telepathic and mental reach also gets a pretty good XP boost. The third eye is all about seeing the geometry of the universe so that it can focus in on a very specific shape or expand its vision to a very wide understanding of all of the patterns in life and how they connect. You can imagine how you might switch between them on the fly too. Let's say you're camping out with some friends on a moonlit night. Everyone feels safe. Maybe there's some brotherly bonds being created while some guy plays a guitar around a campfire. You're telling a story, sharing meaningful experiences with your companions. And in this moment, your primary or dominant chakra is the heart and throat. And it's right around then that the bear shows up. And for the sake of the story, let's imagine that he's very hangry. Naturally, there's a lot of physical responses. Adrenaline surges throughout the body. Your fight or flight response kicks in too, both of which are a reflection of the energetic shift within you. Think about it, everyone panics. Now nobody feels safe and everyone scatters, running for their lives. I mean, duh. It's a freaking bear. And he's having a bad day, taking one down, making a mess just to turn it around. Everyone's reality lens drops down to the root focus all at once. You all go into survival mode and remain there until everyone feels safe again. After which you can scale back up the lower centers until we reach our equilibrium with each other, wherever that threshold is within your particular group. This example, of course, is only one of many possible responses to a hangry bear showing up. Depending on the awareness and training of the group, the responses could vary anywhere from calmly turning your back and walking away in peace, all the way to an energetic nod to the bear that you're friendly. And if the bear is interested, they'd love to do some photography together. The idea here is to say that if someone such as, let's say Jesus was in this circumstances, he'd probably radiate so much light and love and energy that the bear would be like, bro, teach me as they would be communicating on an energetic and telepathic level and they'd be right as rain, super good friends. And on that note, human to animal communication is far more elegant and simple than we realize. However, that said, we as humans are not quite at that level yet. So we don't exactly recommend going out and trying to take a selfie with a bear, at least not without some salmon or something to distract it. So generally what is required to expand your consciousness into the higher centers is a stable foundation of understanding and a healthy mental emotional connection within. The process of moving higher is in fact a shift in awareness and transition into the heart beyond the wall of the first half step. Now, previously we regarded the heart wall as a half step, but moving forward, I wanna continue this discussion and concept as a mirror wall, which also has some practical aspects to it for us today. In practice, when you see the mirror wall through these chakra lenses, it just shows you what you already know. And when you step through it, move into the heart, everything gets bigger. It's very through the looking glass style. This mirror wall or half step is essentially an invisible wall that hides the higher chakras from spirit when it's exploring the lower ones, especially when it's still new to this reality. But once a level of mastery has been established within the first three chakras, spirit can catch a glimpse of, or even move into the next part of life experiences stepping through the looking glass. Sometimes if there's a lot of shadow and darkness within oneself, we can refer to it as a black mirror because it's hard to look at when you go within yourself. It's dark and sometimes very scary. And yet we must be willing to face our inner darkness, face our black mirror or our mirror wall in order to step through it. I mean, hey, even Link had to face his shadow self in Ocarina of Time, right? 
Very briefly, however, we must touch on a rather secretive chakra that isn't really mentioned a lot, but is very important in energy work and within the higher paradigm. It's known sometimes as the Zayal chakra and is said to be located at the base and back of the skull. Physically, this chakra governs the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and several other automatic functions, but it's also said to be the gatekeeper to your state of consciousness. It seems almost to be kind of like Da'at on the tree of life. It connects directly with the pineal and pituitary glands, the crown chakra, the heart chakra, and the Kundalini, and acts as a primary channel for cosmic energy like the crown, but serves to anchor that pranic juice to the physical plane. Because of this, it's very often used in occult practices and the magic arts as a means of manifestation, which is an idea echoed in many of its other names, like the mouth of God, the well of dreams, the jade gate, the jade pillow, or the ascension chakra. In fact, working with this chakra helps to completely balance the main chakra system and supports the natural healing ability of the body. Very Da'at-like indeed. Because it acts as a doorway of sorts for the universal energy to flow into the lower centers, a lot of people link this chakra with spiritual abilities like clairvoyance, telepathy, and multidimensional communication. Awakening and working with the Zayal chakra will also awaken many of our dormant abilities too. So while it is recommended you start with the root, think of the Zayal as a supporting chakra that helps to make the awakening process even easier. And to relate this to the existing chakra system, this one might be between the third eye and the crown, probably like the F sharp key on the 12 chakra piano system. And in case this doesn't make sense, let's bring it full circle with this. What we're looking at here is the human eight chakra system, the primary chakras or nodal points running up and through the body. According to the wisdom teachings from which these systems come, human energy moves in the pattern you see here as an unfolded star tetrahedron opening up into a chain. The transition steps are located between the third and fourth chakras and the seventh and eight chakras. The difference between this system, seven and eight, or 12 and 13, is really just about how you're analyzing the data. It's all the same data at the core level, but it's just different dimensions or angles of observation. So let's look at how the geometry of this actually works. We've looked at this before, and this time we're gonna go even deeper. The key here is actually many keys. I know, mind boggling, right? It's all inlaid in a piano. You know how an octave on a keyboard has five black keys and seven white keys? Those black keys are mid-steps, known as semitones, between each of the white keys, which are called whole tones. In music theory, they're called sharps or flats, depending on which key that you're using as a reference point. Normally, one white key to a black key is a half step, and with the black key in the middle, from white to white is referred to as a whole step because you're moving a semitone or a full tone up the scale respectively. However, when it happens between two white keys, this is an unusual transition, though less common, but still pertinent. It's a 90 degree shift in tones throughout the audible spectrum. And this is actually a pretty big deal when you relate it with consciousness. That half step between white keys is a point of transition, the singularity in aha moments when all of the dots of your life all connect with each other in a new way. Now, there's actually a lot more to this octave-based understanding that we want to elaborate a bit more here too. It's actually pretty simple when you think about it in terms of a 13 extra dimensional chakra system. Although we should say, you can use either system, both the eight system and 13 one have different benefits for different circumstances. See, the chromatic scale on a piano has 12 notes and the 13th is the return note, or rather the first note of the next octave. In every octave, there are seven notes, and then the eighth is just the return note for the next octave, as well as overlapping with the previous one. This means that the eighth chakra of the octave, and by extent, the 13th chakra of the chromatic scale are ultimately the same note and have the same role or purpose. And fully as a fun side note here, but if you're interested in joining me personally in learning piano, I've been doing some live streams lately on my own personal channel, and I'll link that in the comments below too, just in case you wanna pop your head in. But to bring the conversation of all of these chakras to a close, it really is just the same 12 notes in creation that repeat over and over again at different wavelengths. It applies to music, to sound, it applies to color, and it even applies to us. Everything is cyclical and interconnected. Hidden in the chakra system we all know and love, there is a secret code that will help us to ascend to higher consciousness much faster. Recalling the concept of the mirror wall or the half step, generally speaking, 
Despite their existence, you won't really know that they're there until you've mastered all of the lower centers to a certain degree. So for the most part, when you're growing up, you're usually in the three lower chakras like we talked about earlier. You may be in all of them at once or maybe mostly in one and partly in the others, or it could be constantly moving, some kind of blend or a combination of all three. Interestingly though, this pattern is true not just of a person, but of a country, a planet, a galaxy, or anything living, as everything alive arguably has its own chakras, even Mother Earth herself. At any level of existence, this same pattern of movement occurs. Let's take a country like the United States, for example. This is a brand new country in comparison to the old world. Compared to other countries such as those in Europe or India or even China, modern America is just a wee little baby and one that has largely ignored the wisdom and spiritual advances of others, such as the First Nations people for a long time. Up until the 1950s, the vast majority of people in America were in one of the three lower chakras. Not everybody, of course, but most. Their biggest concerns in life revolved around power, money, materialism, houses, cars, sex, food, especially with survival aspects, making sure they've stored up enough money to feel secure. It was a very materialistic world that set the stage for the consumer culture of the 1950s America that was outlined in such great classics of American literature, Revolutionary Road, Death of a Salesman, Slaughterhouse Five, as well as the poetry of Robert Lull, who referred to the period as the tranquilized 50s. You know, the best phrase about this whole thing that summarizes the situation perfectly and to a certain extent echoes the world today comes from the comic book Watchmen by Alan Moore. When visiting a seemingly war-torn New York City, seeing protesters stealing TVs and being consumed by their own consumer culture, the character Night Owl asks the comedian, whatever happened to the American dream? And his friend looks at him dead in the eye, laughs and says, <laughs> what happened? It came true, you're looking at it. But something did happen. In the 1960s, the act of changing one's consciousness began to rapidly alter what was thought to be normal. We had the first psychedelic revolution, and while the world's governments quickly put the hammer down, the damage, or blessing, was done. People began to practice meditation and enter into their own higher centers. The movement was spearheaded by many artists, such as the Beatles, who engaged in transcendental meditation when recording the famous White Album while staying at an ashram in India. They, along with many other artists, such as Jimi Hendrix, even made use of LSD to produce wild and innovative periods of creativity that changed music and counterculture forever. Now, please understand, America was not the first to do this. If you go to an old country like India, Tibet, and certain parts of China, you'll find that at some point in their history, they also moved into their higher centers. They, as a country, moved through the mirror wall, as many legendary yogis such as Yogananda have described. While India may struggle financially, they have a tremendous wealth of spirituality. To that end, you can observe that there is a difference between moving into the higher centers as a country rather than as a species. It isn't really a fully enlightened state, but rather a more conscious one of their individual collective. As they moved through these higher centers, they would have eventually come to another mirror wall at the crown, keeping the focus to this new realm and everything that they have discovered before. A funny thing about mirror walls, once a person, family, group, city, or country moves beyond the first one, they are never the same again. Once they know that there's something more to life than what they have previously thought, they'll spend the rest of their life trying to figure out how to get back to those upper centers, even if they had just a fleeting experience of those higher worlds. In terms of a person or a country, once it gets above the first half step moving into the heart, the sound currents, the geometries, and the spiritual nature of things, what sometimes happens is that they lose their concern about the lower centers of consciousness. They sort of stop seeming to care about their physical side as much, like whether their house is nice or even if they have a house anymore. They're more concerned about the information, their learning and their experiences that they're having in relationships with nature and each other in higher consciousness. You see it all the time with hippies, but now I'm on a tangent. So sometimes when you look at these older countries, they seem to be physically almost devastated because their whole focus is trying to find out what reality is like on these higher levels. Ultimately, they begin to crave more connection, more communication, more family over material wealth. Once a country actually moves through the final mirror wall into the eighth chakra together, which is very difficult, mind you, their main concern is what happens after death, which often means ego death. Their focus becomes the next level of life and they reset to the root of a new, higher cycle. 
So again, the country isn't concerned with physically dying. It's not like some mass suicide or anything weird like that. Rather, it's about what's next for everything that they've learned in their journey so far, the next cycle beginning. We might think of this in relationship to say ancient Egypt. Branches of culture were created. Wisdom was taught to foreigners and trade was established. New cultures and new societies formed with different groups of the world merging and expanding together. Ancient Egypt essentially died or passed into new cycles and new worlds were born as a result, many of which adopted or integrated and even transformed the ancient Egyptian teachings into something new. So how might this relate with us personally or even looking at us as a species? Well, even though on many levels, humanity as a whole is still operating in the lower centers, there are aspects of us that are moving into a higher awareness and beyond the crown. We are in a profound age of information right now. As we evolve as a species, expanding our understanding of everything, our new understanding is changing the way that we live physically. Ultimately, this is the quote unquote death stage beyond the crown and a rebirth of the root all over again. Modern technology gives us a glimpse of this in a profound way. The industrial revolution a few hundred years ago gave birth to a wide array of new advances for humanity, but the technology was still in its infancy and we didn't really know what we were doing to the world in a big picture kind of way. For running engines and motors from engineering plants to the invention of automobiles, we burned and refined oil in mass to stimulate the world's economy in tremendous ways. For a long time, this was a really great thing for us as a species. It connected us and created a new level of society. However, with all that we know today, we are now seeing that perhaps drilling so much oil and plowing down rainforests and polluting the oceans may not be the best thing for anyone or even the natural world. With this new expansive perception, it sends us out of the crown and back to the root with new information than we had before and new questions are asked. How can we transform our current technology to be sustainable? How can we birth a new paradigm for all of life on earth? There's no question that we've peaked at the life cycle for the fossil fuel industry, which will have no choice but to transition sooner than later. And the more people that get on board with this, the faster we all move towards a sustainable, cleaner future for all of us. This is just one microcosmic example of a larger human story, but it's a rather important one. If we can see the pattern of awakening and physical change and see how it relates both personally and collectively, it makes it smoother for all of us to let go of old ways of thinking and move into a higher, better world for all of us that much faster. And as it were, perhaps one of the most ultimate of means by which to do this, to bring higher light and awareness to the world is by activating the light body. When discussing the concept of chakras, prana and energy pathways, there's one major thing we have to cover, the coiled snake itself, the divine feminine Shakti force, or as it's best known in the West, the Kundalini serpent. In yogic philosophy, the Kundalini is a manifestation of the cosmic divine feminine known as Shakti, and is often said to be located in or around the root chakra, solar plexus, or at the base of the spine. When cultivated with care, an open heart and disciplined tantric practice, a Kundalini awakening can bring tremendous spiritual power and liberation. It's safe to say that anyone who has delved into yoga or Hindu philosophy at any point has probably come across this idea. The history behind this vital force though, is not as well known. The phrase Kundalini was originally associated with deities in the Shaktism sect of Hinduism before the ninth century, when it was adopted into the Hatha yoga system, where it was likened to an energy force that could be awakened with postures and meditation. The word itself is mentioned in the Upanishads and is an adjective that meant circular or annular. But it isn't until the 12th century Rajatarangini text that it's likened to a snake being coiled. In the Mahabharata epic, there is a Naga, old school serpent deities called Kunda, whose name is thought to have meant bowl or container, which probably had a linking effect too. Later on, after being taken in by the Hatha yogis of the 16th century, Kundalini started to become used as a technical word to describe practices rather than being an energy or God force itself. Our modern visualization of it as a snake though, can be attributed to the Indian spiritual teacher, Eknath Iswaran, who translated the word as coiled power, saying that it was a force of energy coiled at the base of the spine like a serpent. Awakening the Kundalini force is said to open the chakras as it climbs the spine towards the crown, 
giving us great insight, knowledge, and psychic power as it moves through our body. And like the chakras themselves, everything from meditation and breath work to yoga can serve to guide it into an awakening. Each chakra is said to contain special characteristics and with proper training, moving the Kundalini through each chakra can help express or open those aspects of yourself, revealing the inner worlds of the divine forces and consciousness of the soul and spirit. It's worth noting though, that many Hindu texts caution against waking it up too early or without a guide who can help you through it, as an awakening too soon can cause an imbalanced energy field and disrupt the flow and have some weird side effects too. Hindu tradition often tells us that in order to integrate the spiritual energy that the Kundalini brings properly, a period of careful purification and strengthening of the body and nervous system is required beforehand. While a guide can be helpful, you yourself need to be prepared by doing things like breath work and meditation, exercise and eating healthy, and visualization to ensure a healthy awakening. But above all, like the Merkaba, the whole thing must be approached with an open and full heart. Many gurus and practitioners who have successfully awakened the Kundalini energy have described the feeling as a distinct electrical or heat current running along the spine or a cool breeze being felt along the tips of the fingers, almost as if you're floating. The Divine Life Society have said that during an awakening, super sensual visions appear before the mental eye of the aspirant. New worlds with indescribable wonders and charms unfold themselves before the yogi. Planes after planes reveal their existence and grandeur to the practitioner and the yogi gets divine knowledge, power and bliss in increasing degrees when Kundalini passes through chakra after chakra, making them to bloom in all their glory. In our world today, many people are starting to awaken this energy within them naturally as our planetary frequency is increasing, but many do so too soon. Funnily enough, Mental problems associated with the practice of Kundalini work have become so common that there's even a Kundalini syndrome diagnosis in psychology. People like Turner and Barnhouse outlined a bunch of psychological difficulties appearing in people engaged in intensive spiritual practice in 1995. Later on, research in fields like transpersonal psychology found patterns of sensory, motor, mental, and affective symptoms associated with people going through a Kundalini awakening and coined the term Kundalini syndrome. Now, we're not saying it's dangerous or anything like that. The Kundalini energy is a part of you and entirely natural. So like the chakras, there's no need to be afraid of it. Many of the psychologists diagnosing mental issues or episodes associated with Kundalini work are simply not familiar with the Eastern systems and don't understand what's going on. So they call it a syndrome and misdiagnose it. Like plant medicine, a Kundalini awakening can purge much of the stagnant and negative energy within the nadis and meridians resulting in a sometimes violent purge. But this should be seen more as a flushing out of the old to make room for the new, more than a syndrome or issue. It's even believed in new age groups that all living things have a Kundalini, as it's a form of dormant spiritual energy that connects us to the universal cosmic flow. Following Drumvalo's account, even the earth has her own Kundalini. Drumvalo tells us that every 13,000 years, a sacred and secret event takes place that changes everything. Mother Earth's Kundalini energy emerges from its resting place in the planet's core and moves like a snake across the surface of our world to wherever the next spiritual center will be. Once it was at the home in ancient Lemuria, and then it moved to Atlantis, then to the Himalayan mountains of India and Tibet. And with every relocation, it changed our understanding of what spirituality means to us as a species, including a masculine or feminine dominance in our overall understanding. Recently, with much difficulty, the world serpent moved from Tibet to the Andes Mountains of Chile and Peru. Some people even believe it to be residing along with the sacral chakra of the earth inside Lake Titicaca. One thing can be certain though, whenever the Kundalini moves, a huge paradigm shift often follows, which could be the secret reason or code behind many of the events going on in the world today. We all know about the major seven chakras. They're literally everywhere in mainstream culture these days. I mean, even Pixar has been telling us to open our crown chakra, right? But that said, how many of us are familiar with the minor chakras? In Eastern traditions, we find numerous references to the pathways and channels of energy in practices such as Tantra, Taoism, yoga, and many others, which describe that our bodies are filled with chakras, thousands upon thousands of tiny chakras all over the place, which work together to form our energy body of consciousness. Part of these teachings include the energetic pathways connecting our subtle bodies that are known as nadis, which can be thought of as the highway that connects each chakra 
and are what enable the flow of everything from consciousness to prana. Even in the physical body, the nadis are said to be channels that carry air, water, nutrients, blood, and other bodily fluids around the body and are similar to the arteries, veins, and capillaries. Now, the number of nadis of the body is claimed to be up to hundreds of thousands or even millions. But like many things, the interpretation varies hugely. In one text, the Shiva Samhita, there are said to be 300,000 nadis, with 14 of them being the central and most important ones. Of those 14, the three most vital ones that connect to the spine and are associated with the chakras are the Ida, the Shushumna, and the Pingala. Along the chakras, yogic philosophy speaks on the importance of directing prana into the Shushumna Nadi specifically, enabling the Kundalini to rise, bringing forth an awakening, which we've talked about in our episode about the Kundalini. The three main Nadis also embody our energetic polarities and help with the flow of prana into and out of the chakras. For the most part, Ida is associated with lunar energy and our divine feminine aspect. It's also a Sanskrit word that means comfort and is said to run up the side of the body from the pelvis to the left nostril. Pingala is associated with solar energy, something echoed in its meaning as orange or tawny and links with our sacred masculine. Like the Ida, Pingala runs from the right side of the pelvis up to the right nostril. Shushumna is the central nadi, often associated with the spine, and in Swara Yoga is associated with both nostrils being open and free. While not specifically being gendered, perhaps we can think of this nadi as a kind of divine child archetype. All in all, the nadis work in harmony with our physical and astral bodies to facilitate the flow of energy between each chakra. And as long as they remain open, the energy will flow naturally and without blocks. You might even think of the chakras as pit stops or gas stations on the nadi energy highway. Interestingly, we find a very similar concept in traditional Chinese medicine in the idea of meridians, where qi flows through them similarly to the nadis. In fact, the Taoist Qigong practice of the microcosmic orbit is very similar to the practice of Nadi Shuddha in Kriya Yoga. So much so that some schools claim the technique is taught universally in every age by an avatar of God known as Babaji. While the historicity of the techniques in India prior to the early 20th century aren't well established, it's fun to speculate about where they might've come from and why such systems are so similar. In practices like acupuncture, there are about 400 points, although some people argue there are more given that some points are bilateral. Generally, the meridians are split into two groups of main points and are extraordinary points, which all correspond to pathways, organs, and a yin and yang energy nature that once balanced will allow the proper flow of chi into the body. In more modern new age circles, we find the idea of axiotonal lines that are pretty similar too. Generally, they create the energy network in the light body where all dimensional frequencies are translated into the meridians, chakras, and etheric body. These 12 vertical lines move throughout the entire light body running energy to the chakras. And much like the chakras themselves, each line has a corresponding dimension, chakra crystal, and frequency color. If you've ever seen a picture of an aura or energy body and see those egg-shaped lines coming out of the body, those are the axiotonal lines. Now, whether you consider each meridian or nadi point an individual chakra is up to you, but one of the more major of the minor chakras are the hand or wrist chakras. These are energy centers or vortexes present at, you guessed it, the wrists and palm centers. While often glossed over in a lot of discussions, these centers are what allows us to move energy through ourselves and into the outside world. So if you're struggling sensing energy with your hands, like in Reiki, the reason why might be blockages of the hand chakras. While not often talked about, these are potentially lower dimensional chakras that exist on the lower planes. That is the subtler microplanes or subverses between our physical world and others but they form such a fundamental part of our nature nonetheless. Based on personal experiences, there is some kind of energy below the root around the feet that seem to act as a kind of bag for our past life memories and experiences that can be accessed when bringing all of the chakras into alignment, especially when working with higher multidimensional chakras. If our soul really is this multidimensional entity that has a presence in every dimension or plane of existence, what would fourth, fifth, or sixth dimensional chakras even look like? What correspondences and roles would they have in our subtle bodies? Or even more simply, do we even have super higher dimensional chakras at all? Different systems refer to these higher scale chakras as different things, but one of the most simple versions is that they're called the outer chakras. Of course, people like Sadhguru have argued that we have 144 chakras composed of major and minor ones throughout the body. However, we should remember that while we can speak in terms of lower and higher chakras, such language is often too easily misunderstood. 
It is like comparing the foundation of a building to a roof. The roof is not superior to the foundation. The foundation of the building is more basic to the building than the roof, and the quality, lifespan, security, and stability of the building depends, to a large extent, on the foundation rather than the roof. But in terms of language, the roof is higher and the foundation is lower. If we think of chakras one through seven as third dimensional physical chakras, then conceptually speaking, we can think of chakras eight through 15 as the fourth dimensional ones and 16 through 22 as the fifth dimensional ones. Our soul probably has even more than that. But according to Thoth, once things get past the sixth dimension, they get so entirely different that no one can conceptualize what's going on exactly and translate it back to 3D. So we can stick to this framework for now. Chakras eight through 15 pertain to how we can impact our existence in the fourth dimension. That is space and time and chakras 16 through 22 are thought to affect how we interact with events and circumstances that may be aspects of source consciousness and perhaps even other realities. In other words, they are the chakras of our higher selves. While there are countless systems, since no one has an agreed upon convention, it is more important than ever to have your own experience with these chakras and form your own views. Thus, everything we're about to explore here can be seen as one interpretation of our most general understanding. Thinking of each chakra as a set of octaves arguably means that chakra eight, located above the crown, is the root chakra of the next dimension and our astral body. It is often referred to by many different names, such as the higher heart or seat of the soul. But in shamanic practice, it is called the soul star, which we think is just a fabulous name. Since the fourth dimension is largely temporal, as we begin to work with this chakra, we come to an understanding of the timeless nature of our own soul. In its fullest expression, it encompasses all of our creative imagination, how receptive we are to new experiences and wisdom and our perception of what life is like, as well as being associated with transcendence into the next world and divine wisdom. Color-wise, the soul star chakra is thought to be a kind of turquoise, although it's fair to say that the true colors of these may be outside of the color spectrum that we can easily comprehend at this point. Above that is the ninth atomic doorway chakra encompassing a vibrant green similar in color to the heart. This chakra deals with all the skills encapsulated in the crown chakra and overlays that person with all of the acquired skills that they've left behind by their residual karmic experiences. Chakra 10 is known as the solar star, not to be confused with the earlier soul star. This is a cosmic chakra that deals with our karmic baggage and depending on the paradigm is either located above the ninth chakra or below the feet as the position resets for our new body. The color associated with it is a kind of pearl or white. Chakras 11 and 12 are said to be found within the hands. 11 is our galactic chakra that connects us to all other forms of life in the cosmos. It corresponds to the solar plexus in the third dimension and has an orange pink color and deals with memory and past life experiences. Chakra 12 is the earth chakra that deals with detachment to the third dimension and our ability to act as independent observers of our reality and shines a brilliant gold. Chakra 13 is known as the mother or Gaia chakra and connects us to the Christ consciousness grid of the planet. It shines a pink violet and has a very natural feel to it. Supposedly, it is located outside of the body about an arm's length in front of it. It deals with the unconditional love and joy that our mother can give us if we are open to receiving it. Chakra 14 is the divine sun chakra and vibrates a dark blue. When chakra 14 activates, we can see the connections and understand their synchronicity and truly become aware of the divine plan, similar to the third eye chakra, but on a much grander scale. Chakra 15 is the final chakra of the fourth dimension and corresponds to the crown and is the counterpart to our earth mother chakra embodying our divine father. It is at this point that we start to lose connection to our physical sense of being all together. We become something outside of ourselves, something part of a much larger reality. As such, it shines a warm yet powerful white gold color. Moving into the fifth dimension, these are the chakras belonging to our light body, our higher self that emits pure light. Diana Cooper explored these higher chakras in a book called A New Light on Ascension. The 16th chakra root is the base of this system and is related to divine wisdom and flow, shining a bright platinum color. It is a chakra of ascension into the higher realms. Chakra 17 shines a kind of magenta and embodies the truest form of the divine feminine and deals with our complete sense of oneness with the entire universe. In a way, it unites the learning of the chakras in the fourth dimension and brings about an ability to sense everything that ever was and that which is yet to come. Chakra 18 mirrors chakras 11 and 12 from earlier 
and deals with our interaction with our galactic self. It is what allows us to channel information from the Ascended Masters back to our reality, crossing all kinds of boundaries. In true enlightened fashion, it shines a brilliant gold color. Chakra 15 is the fifth dimensional heart center and aligns us with the cosmic heart. In this chakra, we become connected to the universal Christ consciousness, far beyond just earth. It is pure white and encompasses a connection and love for all aspects of the entire universe. The 20th chakra is the fifth dimensional throat and therefore shines a royal blue. It is a chakra of co-creation and embodies the phrase, I am. This is the chakra that grants us the true knowledge of communication with the divine, coming to an understanding that we ourselves are an aspect of the source and can create that which we speak. Chakra 21 is the fifth dimensional third eye and has a kind of crystal translucent color. Rather than simply perceiving other realities, as you did in the third and fourth dimensions, you become part of the vision and experience yourself becoming a part of every conceivable reality. Finally, the 22nd chakra is the fifth dimensional crown and again has a kind of platinum or crystalline color. This chakra is the point at which we merge with our higher self and become a true transcendent being, an ascended master of our own. There are likely many more chakras as we move through the different dimensions of consciousness, each bringing with them a new and fuller understanding of our true existence and nature. But it is unlikely that we'll be able to access these higher chakras just yet, at least not until we move collectively through the various half steps and mirror walls that we've talked about in this series. So we'll leave it here for now. And please always remember your higher self already knows this information. You've simply forgotten with each incarnation. So while it may seem confusing and hard to keep track of right now, I have no doubt that there will come a time when this information makes sense to you. And everyone here at Spirit Science is on a mission to make that happen. Alas, while lately we've been looking at the chakras, minor and major, soul star and beyond, along with the Kundalini and more, the truth is the chakras truly are only a stepping stone to an even greater awareness. And so today it's time to dive deep into the nature of the light body itself. So buckle up and get ready. And if you haven't yet, make sure to download the free chakra meditation to get the most of your light body experience. Links in the description, please enjoy the video. When exploring the light body, one of the first things you might learn is actually about auras. In new age circles, auras are usually thought to be a kind of energy that emits from your body and follows the same frequency pattern as the chakras, where the root is the smallest body, the physical form, and then the sacral body, solar body, heart body, and so on radiate outwardly around you. Many people claim to see auras, and there are actually techniques that may help you to do so, including unfocusing your eyes on a person or even just putting a hand in front of a black screen. It's not uncommon to see either a colored or white glow around the object of your focus. The aura system mirrors the chakra system almost identically because in a way it's part of the same system. The aura reflects your energy body on the outside, just as your chakras reflect your energy body on the inside. However, both of these systems weave together to create the human light body, much like how when you put the seven colors together in light, you get pure white light. The thing is, there are actually many different types of light bodies reflecting different geometries that can be necessary for different purposes. The most commonly discussed one is the star tetrahedron, but you can have a light body based on any of the platonic solids. And then there is even the covenant 486 Merkaba, which is said to be the root of the tree of life system itself, and which we explore in our spirit medicine walkers workshop at the end, for those who are interested. For the purposes of simplicity, today we're going to be exploring the original Merkaba that we learned, which is a great place to get started. But before we jump into anything else, there's something we must know. No matter how much you try to understand the light body, Merkabas and chakras through the sacred geometry and logical explanations, it will never be enough on its own. As Drumvalo has explained, there is a missing half of our understanding that is purely experiential and can only be experienced through your own practice when centered with love. As we understand it, the Merkaba is the divine light vehicle used by ascended masters to connect with and reach the higher realms. It is the full extent of our energetic and subtle body that when fully active encompasses our whole self and can stretch out to anywhere between 55 and 72 feet. This particular one is based on the blueprints of Metatron's cube and the tetrahedral energy field, taking the shape of two counter-rotating tetrahedrons spinning around the body in line with the chakras up the spine as the axis. And though while it may look like there's only two star tetrahedrons, there's actually three, but the third is overlaid onto the others and is often forgotten about in the meditations. The Merkaba is an extension of our energy field. 
or our collective energy field that acts as a vehicle which allows us to move through the different dimensions and frequencies all around us. The word itself actually comes from the Hebrew word that means chariot or cart and forms a huge part of Ezekiel's vision in the tradition of Merkaba mysticism. In the book of Ezekiel, the Merkaba is used to refer to the throne chariot of God, the four-wheeled vehicle driven by four cherubim, each of which has four wings and four faces of a man, lion, ox, and eagle, often which are esoterically seen as reflections of the four elements. For the most part, the teachings of the Merkaba mysteries revolved around the visions of the prophet, which were centered around stories of ascension and people transcending the physical world into the realm of God. Some writers have even argued that early Christian theology and discourse was influenced by the Jewish Merkaba tradition to some extent. In fact, some see the accounts of St. Paul, who has been argued to be influenced by Gnosticism, to be one of the earliest first accounts that we have of a Merkaba mystic in Jewish or Christian literature. Throughout Kabbalistic history though, discussions concerning the Merkaba were limited to only the most worthy sages, as it was considered overzealous to ponder on the nature of higher worlds and what they looked like. In more modern teachings, Melchizedek tells us that the Merkaba can be recreated through conscious breathing and meditations in as little as 18 breaths. The first six are for balancing the polarity, the next seven are for proper pranic flow through the entire body, and the final breaths are from shifting the consciousness from third to fourth dimension. And then finally, the last three breaths are for recreating the rotating Merkaba within and around the body. The meditation has a lot of parts though. And while we may animate it one day, if you wanna walk through, you can check out Drumvala Melchizedek's Flower of Life, volume two. Ultimately, the first step to creating and remembering your Merkaba is always love. And even Melchizedek explains that a lot of people don't need all of the left brain steps because the right brain, the experience of love, is enough to activate it naturally. To be clear, there are different kinds of Merkabas out there, absolutely. In fact, in one particular plant medicine ceremony at Rhythmia, Thoth appeared in my inner vision and shared with me a different Merkaba than I'd ever seen before. It was octagonal in nature, surrounding my body with a three-stranded DNA helix spiraling through it and a tremendous volume of rainbow particles shooting out of the bottom and rising up to the top, wild stuff. That said, I know we talk about the importance of love in this kind of stuff a lot, but it really is the most vital part. Love and connection are the very life and heart of the Merkaba and light body that supports the chakras, as love is said to be the frequency of creation itself. To that end, the Merkaba isn't just a tool or some aspect of you, it is alive and fully a part of you. It's no different than how you have a nose or an arm. The Merkaba light body is what lays the blueprints for the nadis and the axiotonal lines that we've talked about before. It literally is the lines that allow the prana, chi, and energy to flow back into you and out into the universe. Our Merkaba is our connection to the divine. It's what links us to each other and the universe itself. So how does the Merkaba light body relate to the chakras exactly? Well, the eight chakras that run through our spine actually have duplicates in the space around our body inside the extended Merkabic field. They're said to look like spheres of energy that vary in size, depending on your own size and height, the same as the Merkaba itself. Like the energetic flow system mentioned earlier, they're laid out in the blueprint of Metatron's cube. Each sphere sits on the edge or point of a tetrahedron and are kind of like our chakras twins. And Melchizedek said he was actually able to find a record of them using a molecular emission scanner. So when it comes down to it, you can think of our spiritual structure like this. First, there is the energy flow through the chakras, which is facilitated by the nadis when we breathe in and out. From there, the meridian points and lesser chakras reach every cell in the body. On top of that, we have the prana field, which is very close to the body and is generated by the flow of energy through the chakras. Going up in layers on top of the pranic field, we have the auric field that extends a few feet around us in every direction and is generated by our thoughts and emotions and energy all working together. This is the realm of the dream time and something that we'll talk about in great detail later on. Guiding and protecting our auric field is another energy field in the shape of the egg of life, the original shape of creation. Once you get past that, you start to get into the realms of light and geometry and our energy takes on a much more geometric nature that can be influenced by our consciousness. Herein, we find the light body, yet these geometries are overlaid across and through all of our lesser systems, much like how streams branching off from a river will be like a smaller fractal of the greater body from which it comes. When you bridge your newly mastered lower centers with the previously unknown higher centers, 
And when you're willing to step through that doorway into what's next, everything in your life has the capacity to change as you step into the life of an empowered creator, creating creation with all that is. Anyway, today's episode is kind of a philosophical what if one in that we're not going to be assessing the scientific studies of energy medicine or the empirical existence of chakras. As even we'll admit, there's a lot lacking in terms of proving alternative medicine. Instead, this time we're gonna take a more open-ended question. What would the world look like if at some point in the future, we actually found scientific evidence of the chakra system? What if we discovered a chakra in the body or all seven? And how would such a discovery affect our approach to different branches of science and philosophy? To start with, let's look real quick at how the chakra system itself came into our Western world. If you've watched our first video on chakras, you'll know that the modern new age understanding identifies them as energy centers or wheels or vortices of energy inside the body that are associated with the classical Newtonian colors. But this wasn't always the case. In fact, the first uses of the term chakra in the Vedas didn't have anything to do with energy at all. Instead, it was used to refer to the wheel of motion that a king had over his empire. Further, even though breath channels, or as they're known in Sanskrit, the nadis, are mentioned in the Upanishads around 1000 BC, again, the chakras and energy centers aren't. Most academics tend to agree that the idea as we know it today came about during medieval India during 800 AD from Buddhist texts that showed them as hierarchies of inner energy centers. But this is still kind of debated since others make the argument that the concept of chakras was only written down during this time, but had been around for much longer. So as always, decide for yourself on what feels right. Even more interestingly, the original Indian and Buddhist concepts of the chakras don't make any reference to colors. That's a completely modern thing. A man named John Woodruff translated two classical Indian texts into English in his book, The Serpent Power, which is largely credited with the introduction of the idea of the seven chakras into the West. You've probably seen a bunch of debates about the amount of chakras, with some people saying there are three, five, six, or like in his version, seven. See, the reason seven chakras are sort of canon is because the text that Woodroffe was translating into English came from a school of thought known as Kaula that believed in seven. And that was just the only version we got in English. Later on, another man named Leadbeater decided that Woodroffe's book was too hard to read and full of jargon. So he published his own, which drew comparisons with the 17th century book, The Theosophia Practica by Johann Gichel, which talked about inner force centers in the body, which were reminiscent of chakras and kind of came to mean the same thing. From that point on, the concept of chakras as inner centers of prana and life energy started to be adapted by theosophist movements and slowly made their way into the new age culture. Now, you might be wondering why I'm going off about all this history but it sets the groundwork for the problems that arise when talking about Eastern concepts in a Western paradigm. This video was actually inspired by a section in Drumvalo's Flower of Life books, where he stated that during his time in a technology lab, his team was actually able to see extensions of the chakras in the Merkaba light body by focusing on or charging each chakra and then scanning that area with a molecular emission scanner or MES machine for short. According to Drumvalo, they originally struggled to find the chakras, but once they started scanning the light body itself, which extends outwards beyond the physical body, the scanner would light up to show that each chakra had a certain pulse attributed with it. So this really begs the question, can the chakras be measured scientifically? And what would happen if a lab one day proved their existence experimentally, as perhaps they may even already have? Now, today, of course, we have things like Kirlian photography and biophoton imaging that seemingly can photograph the human bioelectric field, which some people are likening to the aura. But even this isn't enough to convince skeptics. So what would happen if we proved the chakras in a foolproof way? Well, the first thing would probably be a complete shattering of the current paradigm of understanding. Simply put, if chakras existed, one of the most central aspects of spirituality, what else could exist from that paradigm? First off, this would lead to a complete reevaluation of what we know in fields like biology, chemistry, and physics. It's kind of like a knock-on effect. If one thing was proved, then it would naturally encourage the pursuit of other things, which could lead to similar things like auras, third eyes, and morphogenic fields also being proved and recognized scientifically. Maybe this would even lead to a new branch of science appearing in the mainstream curriculum, a spirit science, if you will. If such discoveries were finally taken seriously, then it would effectively eliminate the stigma between science and spirituality, allowing us to explore both concepts equally 
and reach untold heights of understanding and philosophy. To quote Tesla, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomenon, it will make more progress in one decade than in all of the previous centuries of its existence. But what would society look like? What advances could we make holding the knowledge of the chakra system? Probably the biggest change for us would be in healthcare and medicine. See, the chakras for the most part stem from Ayurvedic tradition of ancient India, which is a practice of healing that stems back over 5,000 years and is often considered to be the foundation of all Eastern medicine practices. Here's where we see the fundamental difference between Western and Eastern practices like we've mentioned earlier. While Western medicine follows the Hippocratic method, one that focuses on curing diseases as they appear or are already present in the body, a paradigm that is incredibly lucrative, we might add, Ayurveda is kind of the opposite in that it's a complete system of medicine that combines natural therapies with a highly personalized approach to treating disease that has the prevention of disease as its primary emphasis. So in this practice, as well as in the chakra tradition, a healthy state is defined as one in which there's a balance between body, mind, and soul in an equilibrium among the doshas or body types. If we somehow proved this system to be accurate and could measure its effectiveness, not only would our general health as a species go up, but so too would our quality of life, harmony with ourselves and our environment, and probably most important during this trying time right now, our relationship with each other would improve. If we could use the chakra system to predict when and where diseases would strike, we could tackle the disease before it took a hold of someone, thereby saving countless lives. Just imagine, oh look, your root chakra is showing this negative energy pattern, a common early sign of cancer. So let's focus on healing that chakra based on what's needed, maybe nutrition, exercise, or some childhood trauma therapy and guarantee that we heal this thing before it gets worse. We could even take it further and nutritionists and sports scientists could design diets and activities specifically catered to keeping your chakras in balance or maybe even target the centers that were out of whack and we could eliminate disease altogether. Of course, having no diseases would probably put big pharma out of business, which would probably make a lot of people lose their jobs. But that $82 billion that Johnson & Johnson made last year could be invested into further research or other branches of science that could lead to even greater discoveries. Like, I don't know, anti-gravity devices or quantum teleportation. I mean, maybe we might even finally find a way to unify quantum physics and the standard model. And guess what else? If we could use the chakra system to effectively eliminate disease, that also means no more healthcare bills or debt for millions upon millions of people. But hey, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. After all, professional Ayurveda people still charge for a session, but it would be nowhere near as much. Even being conservative and saying that we could use the chakra system to complement Western medicine, it could pose a viable option for people who are allergic to certain medication or those who can't leave the house. Further, machines like the Aura Star, which is based on the sciences of biofeedback, reflexology, kinesiology, and concepts in Ayurveda medicine can actually be used to measure biofeedback data and is way cheaper to produce than MRIs or CT scanners and could be used for similar diagnostic treatment. As a side consequence of this, it may even start to eliminate class divides with regards to access to treatment. Since the machines can be produced for much cheaper, anyone could access them. Just try and picture it. You wake up one morning and you're feeling a bit groggy or fatigued. You're suffering from low self-esteem. You grab your coat, drive to your local GP, and the doctor tells you that your solar plexus is weaker than normal and prescribes a series of meditations, foods, and exercises to help you get back to flowing normally. Heck, imagine couples or marriage counseling where people could go to therapy to work on rebalancing their throat chakra to enable better communication. What about energy itself? Following numerous new age beliefs, all living things have chakras. Since the earth itself is a living being, she too has chakras dotted around various places. What if we could somehow tap into these huge reservoirs of energy to produce a natural, renewable, and healthy source of energy that could replace the fossil fuel industry? If you watched our other videos on chakras, we pointed out that as wheels of energy, they both act as magnets for the energy around us and as channels for the universal source of energy to flow through us. Hmm, maybe we could even tap into our own auras or chakras to produce our own power by channeling the source field. Imagine being able to charge your phone using your solar plexus and some kind of electromagnetic induction. How cool would that be? Maybe it's a little far out there. I don't know if that's possible, but the conversation is at least worth considering. Again, this would do wonders for eliminating class divides and would also help to clean up the environment massively. 
I wonder if Greta would get behind that. But I guess if that happened, a lot of people would claim that the introduction of chakras to the world were a part of the Illuminati's plans to take over, and then we'd all beeline it back to drilling oil. So yeah, anyway. Probably the most important aspect of our lives that would be changed by the knowledge of the chakras though, would be our understanding of emotions, personal energy, and how interconnected we really are. We've been saying this for a while now, but while all of the problems of today appear as separate incidents, they're all ultimately coming from the same source, an unbalanced spirit body, a disconnection between our egos and our souls, and the feeling of separation from each other. Knowing about the chakras would change all of that, we would finally understand which areas of our spiritual body influenced which chakras, which in turn influenced certain aspects of our physical lives. By working through the chakras together, we could effectively help to dissolve our ego as a species. We would be guided by a sense of compassion and unity rather than ruled by a fear of separation. We could set up centers for meditation and healing that would cater to each chakra imbalance and help heal each other. It might even lead to the legalization of plant medicine as a means of healing and mental well being and therapy. Conceptually, though, as we mentioned earlier, this would cause a paradigm shift that could cause scientists to examine things from an inherently more spiritual perspective, perhaps even allowing for consciousness itself to be factored into equations, leading to untold discoveries about our place in the universe and how we ourselves affect and shape reality. Ultimately, discovering a way of measuring the impact of any treatment or practice on the energy system of an individual would break ground in our current system, both in terms of healthcare and scientific thinking. Examining the combination of practices, such as the chakras and other related alternative medicines in the context of how they are used in our current medical paradigm is a further step in this direction. Really, there's nothing to lose. Further scientific study into things like the bioelectric or morphogenic fields and the concept of chakras in general can only provide clearer and potentially paradigm altering results. Even from a hardcore atheistic point of view, if such things didn't exist at all, more detailed study would prove that, which would also have an impact on society as a whole and at least evolve our more philosophical understanding instead. Whatever way the coin falls, we have the potential to change society by understanding the chakra system better. So what do you think? What kind of changes would proving the chakra system scientifically bring about in your life? What do you think society would look like? Let us know in the comments below. And if you're interested in exploring the chakras more, please come and check out the seven day transformation in which over just one week, we'll go through each of the chakras with you together and help you to clear out and transform at every level. Until next time, stay in balance and we'll see you soon.